Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ida Lupino, Brian O'Hearn, and Conrad Veit in A Woman's Face. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The power of a woman's face was best described by a man. It was the poet who called the lovely visage of Helen of Troy the face that launched a thousand ships. For Helen's beauty had caused a war and altered the course of history, just as the faces of women ever since have changed the destinies of men. You'll hear a story about another such woman tonight, finally acted by Brianna Hearn, Ida Lupino, and Conrad Veidt. Metro Goldwyn Mayer's powerful screenplay, A Woman's Face. The course of a man's or a woman's life is determined by strange things, like the facial scar which has warped the soul of the woman in tonight's play. But the story of her regeneration is stranger still. I think it's a kind of drama which will thrill every one of you, and that's a big order, for I'm constantly amazed at the far corners into which Lux Flakes reaches to bring this audience together every Monday night under one roof. For instance, here's a letter from a lonely corner of the great western desert. A lady writes, You can't know how much the Lux Radio Theater means to us out here. My husband works in a tungsten mine in the desert. And since that's a war metal, everyone is working very hard. You are just about the only contact with the theater we have, because our nearest town is 60 miles away, and the road isn't very good. Naturally, our trips to town... We stock up on the things we need. So when we buy Lux Flakes, we get enough at once to cause quite a snowstorm in this desert if they should ever get loose. Thanks again for your plays and for your fine product. We salute this family and millions of others who are doing their part without benefit of fanfare. Certain time comes now for a woman's face. And here's Act One, starring Ida Lupino as Anna Holm and Brianna Hearn as Dr. Sager. Conrad Veidt, who is making the Metro Goldwyn Mayer picture above suspicion? We'll play Torsten Barring. The Royal Swedish Court of Stockholm Criminal Division is now in session. The case of the Crown versus Anna Holm, the charge murder. Anna Holm, alias Ingrid Paulson, is on trial for her life. With a prison matron at her side, she stands before the judge. She's dressed in deep black, her face hidden by a heavy veil. A man has been killed. And here once again is enacted the ancient ritual of trial by jury. Here once again the state will demand the ancient forfeit. An eye for an eye, a life for a life. The clerk will summon the witnesses. All witnesses, <coughs> Bernard Dalvik, referentor, Christina Dalvik, Miss Tooth, Emma Christian's daughter, housekeeper, Herman Runvik, waiter, Vera Sagat, housewife, Gustav Sagard, doctor of medicine. <clears throat> you witnesses have been called to testify in this case in which the charge is murder in the first degree. The Crown versus Honor Home, alias... Alias Ingrid Paulson. Alias Ingrid Paulson. You will now take the oath. Do you each and severally, solemnly promise and swear by God in his holy scriptures to tell the truth withholding nothing and adding nothing as God is your help in life and soul? I do. I do. First witness, please. Herman Runbeck. The other witnesses will retire until they are called. Your name? Herman Rundvik, Your Honor. You're acquainted with the prisoner? I was, Your Honor. Your occupation? I... I am a waiter. Well, Mr. Rundvik, your testimony, please. Well, I, I don't rightly remember what date it was, but I know it was night. Uh, it was in June, just a little after midnight. This place where I worked was called the Café Spotterdam, and I was... Who was the owner of the café? That woman over there was the owner, Anna Holm. Go on. Well, I was waiting for the last party to leave, Mr. Torsten Barring and some friends. I heard Mr. Barring talking to Mr. Dalvik, the manager. It seems there was a little trouble about the check. So you no longer wish to extend me credit? Mr. Barring, please. I have offered to sign a check. Isn't that enough? Mr. Barring, if it were I personally who could extend credit, you I would... You own only... the place, don't you? No, unfortunately, I'm only the manager. Then tell your employer that I want to find out why the name of Barring shouldn't be good for credit at a miserable after-hours roadhouse. We're not operating this miserable roadhouse for the benefit of names. 
Even the name of Barry. Oh, are you the proprietor? In a way. You must excuse me. I didn't expect that a woman, especially such a young and charming woman, uh, have you something in your eye? Why do you say that? Pardon me. I thought perhaps uh, the way you are holding your hand over your face. Are you sure there isn't something? We were talking about your credit, Mr. Barring. So we were, and yet I wish you would let me help you here. My, my handkerchief is clean. Just take your hand away from your face a moment. I don't need your help. Oh, please. All right. There. Just hold still. There, it's out. Now, isn't that better? It's a trick I learned from a friend of mine. She had beautiful eyes, too. Did she? Herman, let me have the check. Yes, madam. I'll sign it for Mr. Barring. Enter it as a charge against me if he doesn't pay. Yes, madam. This is a most generous gesture. I never make generous gestures, as Mr. Dalvik will tell you. At any rate, thank you very much, Miss... Miss, um... Holmes. Anna Holmes. It's a name which might be of some assistance to you. Oh, really? In certain quarters where the name of Barring has perhaps lost its magic. Good night, Mr. Barring. Good night, Miss Holmes. testify as to the defendant's behavior that night? If that is all, Your Honor. She signed a check to Mr. Barring, and he left. In your own opinion, why did Anna Holm make this gesture? It was very obvious to us, Your Honor. For the first time in her life, a man had looked at her uncovered face without a shudder. He pretended not even to notice it. Explain that, please. Just what was wrong with Anna Holm's face? It was on the left side, Your Honor, from the outer edge of the eye to the upper lip. A long, red, jagged scar. Next witness, Bernard Dalvik. Mr. Dalvik, you were the manager of the cafe owned by Anna Holm. That is so, Your Honor. You were friendly with the defendant? We all were, Your Honor. Uh, whom do you mean by all? The employees of the cafe? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, the prosecutor for the Crown can very easily explain that. Well? The Crown will prove, Your Honor that the cafe was really just a blind for their activities. Bernard Dalvik, Christina Dalvik, Anna Holm, and the waiter Rundvik were engaged as a unit in the very profitable occupation of blackmail. The Crown will have the opportunity of proving that later. Mr. Dalvik, what was the relationship of the prisoner and the man tossed and barring? Well, sir, we might refer to the relationship as romantic. Anna had never known love before. She became almost gay. She bought new clothes. One afternoon, shortly after, she came to our office in the city. She'd been outside. Good afternoon, Anna. We've been waiting for you. I've been shopping. Oh, my dear, what a becoming home. Beautiful, Anna. A whiff of spring. I know you dear, sweet people are lying. But even the moths were set up with my other hat. Oh, my dear, you never look prettier. Never. That's enough, Christina. What's on for this afternoon? This is Dr. Sager to come. The woman who wants her letters back? Same. Will you see her, Dalvik, and get a good price. Don't I always? you need me, I'll be in my office, but I imagine you can... What's the matter, Anna? Who put this here? Who put a mirror on my wall? Why, Anna, we... How dare you? Haven't I forbidden the mirror ever to be hung in this place? Haven't I? Anna, we... You own... dirty, foul, lonesome swine! <coughs> Anna! Now get out! Get out, both of you! Don't be gone, not so much noise. She's here. She's just outside. Who is? Mrs. Dr. Sager. She's very pretty. Beautiful. Delvet, go and talk to her. Of course, Anna, but I... Did you hear me? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Sagert. How do you do? My, uh, my masseuse directed me here. She implied you might understand my particular problem. Yes? I, I don't quite know how to begin. Possibly I may assist you. Are you married? I'm very happily married. My husband is a saint. Oh, to be sure. But you see, some letters of mine were stolen. Some letters to your husband? No. Oh, he's so stupid. Your husband, Mrs. Sager? No, no, my friend. The one I wrote the letters to. He lost them. Now some stranger keeps telephoning me about them. Hmm, why should he do that? He wants 5,000 kroner. Why, that's out and out blackmail. But what shall I do? I haven't 5,000 kroner. My poor dear woman, perhaps I can help you. I have an acquaintance who might contact this blackmailer and perhaps in view of the circumstances ask for a reduction. Oh. Thank you. Excuse me, my secretary is to see me. I'll be back directly. Well, Anna? I've been listening to you. Reduction, you fool. Now, Anna, a little milk of human kindness. Shut up. I want 10,000 kroner from that woman. Ten? You said five. I want ten. What's the extra five for, Anna? Because she's pretty? The extra five's for me. 
You mean you won't divide? I mean just that. I take 7,000 kroner for myself, and I want it tonight. Make an appointment for me to see her at her home. Anna, what's happened to you? She's in love with Torsten Barling. She wants evening gowns and furs and perfume. Listen, Anna, love is a beautiful thing, but you You'll can't... do as I say, or I'll do it alone. 10,000 kroner. Tonight. Yes? What is it? I have an appointment with you, Mrs. Sager. Come in, please. We can talk in this room over here. Is there anyone else in the house? No, the servants are out and my husband's left in at medical school. You, you may sit down if you wish. Why do you stare at me like that? You're very pretty. Oh, thank you. I believe that you have something to, to sell me? Yes, I have something to sell you. I hope I can afford it. Oh, I'm sure you can. The price is 10,000 kroner. 10,000? But you can't this afternoon. He said five. This afternoon he was mistaken. You have jewelry worth much more. You wouldn't take my jewelry. It's from my husband, and I love him more than anything in the world. He... That isn't the way you described him in these letters to Eric. Give me those letters. Get back. Give them to me. I'll have to shoot you to make you understand. <laughs> Sit down. Such silly letters. <laughs> Such childish writing. Such cheap. You call these love letters. You ever read any real love letters? George Sand, Pete, Browning? Do you know anything about love and that miserable soul of yours that dribbles itself into these letters? Can you imagine loving a man so greatly, so completely, that you'd give everything you have just to be near him? Just to have him near you? Well, that's love as I know it. As you know it. You love it. You love it. Shut up. I'll take that necklace. Now, get me the rest of your jewels. And don't try any tricks. Still one more letter in the safe. Hurry. Very well. Listen. Vera. It's Gustav. Your husband? Oh, Vera, I'm back. Go into the library. There's a window facing the street. Please. I'll come again tomorrow. Oh, quickly, please. Vera, are you home? Uh, yes, dear, I'm here. Oh, well, I wasn't as late as I expected to be, was I? No. I'm glad you're home, Gustav. Oh, what's the matter? You look pale. What in the... What was that? I... I don't know. It came from the library. I'll take a look. No, Gustav. Well, what have we got here? A visitor, eh? Now, don't move, please. I can't. I... Gustav, what is it? It's a visitor. Evidently trying to get out of the window. Unfortunately, the table was in the way. Uh, Vera, turn on the lamp. Oh, she, she's been hurt. She must have fallen. Hey, what's that in her hand? Isn't that your necklace, Vera? Yes, I... Y yes, it is. I'll take that, please. You found it on the street, I suppose. Came in the window to return it. Stand up. I can't. Oh, you can't, eh? Well, perhaps the police will help you. Now call them, Vera. Oh. What is it? My ankle. Well, we'll take care of it. Vera, I asked you to call the police. Yes. Yes, why don't you? Gustav, darling. <laughs> darling. Would you laugh at me if... Oh, she seems so miserable and we're so happy together, you and I. Couldn't we... Couldn't we let her go? Oh, really, Vera? You get quite sentimental at times. Maybe it's because next week is our anniversary. Oh, splendid. Shall I give her the necklace, too? Oh, well, let's fix up the ankle first. I'll get the bandages, done. Oh, and uh, bring some tape. If I do let her go, you know, you can thank her. Bless her dear sweetheart. I'll try to get up. Yep. There we are. Now, just sit down there for a minute. We'll need a little light. Yeah, that's better. Now then, um, if you'll place your foot... Hello. What's the matter with your face? Stop looking at me. Take your hand away. Now you business. Take it away. Aha. Uh -huh. When did this happen? I said mind your business. My dear young woman, this is my business. Hmm. Be ashamed to send a scar like that to jail wouldn't matter. I've served 22 years already. No. Where? Wherever I am. 22 years. Eh? You must have been just a child then when it happened. A rather beautiful child, I should imagine. <laughs> Isn't it a pity? <clears throat> now the little girl is just a thief. Yes, it is a pity. And do you want to know something? You're not as tough as you seem to be. No, of course not, Dr. Sager. Should we talk about love and poetry? The bandages, Gustav? No, oh, thank you. Uh, get my book for me, will you, Vera? Uh, that is over there on the desk. Yes, Gustav. <clears throat> well, Vera, you 
This young lady is interested in love. <laughs> As who isn't? Now, look. Here, here's a man you ought to meet. Splendid chap. Now, take a good look at that picture and notice particularly that most of the skin is torn from his face. Not very pretty, is it? Now, we'll turn the page. And that's the same man. Although you wouldn't know it unless I told you. See, there's not a mark, not a blemish. I did that job in the hospital last March. Here, this, this girl. She's my particular pride and joy. She had a horrible scar on her face. Almost as bad as yours. I've had enough of this. Either let me go or call the police. No, not just yet, please. Vera, look at her face. First off. Look at it. You know, Vera, there's one man in Europe could fix that. No, Gustav, no, not you. Oh, nothing like having your wife's complete confidence. You couldn't. You couldn't fix this. Well, I bow to the superior judgment of you two experts. Don't joke. I don't. Won't be any joke for you neither. I warn you now, it'll mean pain, agony, weeks, months of it, and perhaps a failure. Perhaps leaving you worse off. Worse off? And what? You know, I... I might. I just might. So that someone could look at me. So that I could look back and see in his eyes. Something besides horror. Just help. Listen to me, please. Please, just help. You mustn't do it. You mustn't. <laughs> Stand down, Mrs. Sacred. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Does the Crown wish to place any other witnesses on the stand? Not at the present time, Your Honor. Will the prisoners step forward, please? Oh. Take the stand. Your name is Honor Holm? Yes. Do you, Honor Holm, solemnly promise and swear by God and his holy scriptures to tell the truth, withholding nothing and adding nothing, as God is your help in life and soul? I swear. In your examination before the police, you were unusually frank. I trust you will speak with similar honesty here. Tell your story, if you please. I was born in the North. We were very poor. My father was a brilliant man, but he drank constantly. One night when I was five, he was too drunk to know he set fire to the carpet in my room. When he came to, he saved me, but not himself. Twenty-two years after that, I cursed him for saving me. No one could look at me without loathing. There was no place I could work. And then I met Torsten Barring. For the first time, a, a man had... Well, you've heard about that, did not you? The very next day, I received a note from him. An invitation to come to his apartment. That was before Mrs. Sager came to your offices in the city? That was before anything, except my first meeting with Torsten Barring at the roadhouse. He met me at the door. He raised my hand to his lips. Come inside here. Come and sit down. No one saw me come here. That's a pity. It would have added to my reputation. A reputation as what, Mr. Barring? As a most fortunate man, please, your court. No, I'll keep it on if you don't mind. But I do mind. Last night you were the proprietor. Tonight you are a guest. Thank you. When I came to your door, I heard someone playing the piano. Mm -hmm. You are interested in music? Yes. Piano? Oh, piano, among other things. Chopin? Yes, the early Chopin. For he was made soft and sentimental by George Sand. Mm, that's very interesting. Have you read the love letters of Chopin and George Sand? I've read every love letter ever published. I find they're all very much the same. <laughs> Why did you send for me? I wanted to speak to you, Anna. Did you? What sort of dirty work do you want me to do? But my dear Miss Horn, you were talking about music. I was invited here for one purpose. See no reason for pretending any other. Uh, might we not argue about that perhaps over a glass of wine? No, I don't drink. It's dangerous in my vocation. Restaurant keeper? No. Blackmail. Mm. I like you, Anna Holm. We are very much alike, you and I. We are both proud. Both wretched. What sort of trouble are you in? I don't think I'm in any trouble now, Anna Holm. You might just be some kindly deity's answer to my prayer. Maybe the devil's answer. Very well. The devil's answer. <laughs> Thank you.
beginning of your friendship with Thorsten Baring? Yes, Your Honor. I protest at attaching the sacred name of friendship to this relationship. You are madly, insanely infatuated with this man, weren't you? I loved him. Love. He owned you, body and soul. No. Tell me this. You submitted to an operation on your face, didn't you? Yes. Because of him, wasn't it? Yes. So that you had better assist him in your criminal pursuits. No. No, that, that wasn't the reason. What was the reason? Well, I... I, I wanted... Your Honor, please. Oh. You wanted to look like other women, didn't you? Yes. And you wanted to be like other women. Not walk and twist and fit. Yes. There's no proof of that. Did Thorsten Baring take you to the hospital? No, I went alone. Did Thorsten Baring know you were at the hospital? I was alone. Nobody knew. Anna Ho, tell the court, please. How many operations did you submit to? Answer, please. How many operations did you submit to in the hope that the scar which you bore from childhood might be erased? There were 12 operations. One every month. For a year. In just a moment, Brian Ahern, Ida Lupino, and Conrad Veidt will return for Act Two of A Woman's Face. Now, I want to give the men in our audience a warning. Here's the kind of thing that may happen to you any day now when your wife comes home from shopping. Look, darling, look at the lovely house coat I bought. It's made of rayon and milk. Oh, very pretty. It, it's made of rayon and what? Milk. But you can't wear milk. What happens when you wash it? Well, the girl who sold it told me all I had to do was to lux it. It's all true. And here's our fashion reporter, Libby Collins, to tell us more about it. Actually, this wonderful new fiber is made from casein, one of the things in milk. It's usually combined with cotton or rayon to make stunning warm materials with a soft, wool-like texture. Many can be washed if you use gentle lux. And if it seems odd to be wearing and washing milk, remember lots of the lovely rayon fabrics that lux so beautifully are made from little pieces of wood. And those sheer nylon stockings of yours started out as coal, air, and water. Lux is ideal for washing the wonderful new man-made fibers because it's so very gentle, safe, for anything safe in plain water. Smart stores everywhere advise it for all their fine washables. Yes, all fabrics are precious today. The new ones and the old standbys, too. Cotton and linen and wool. They must last and wear longer than ever now. So don't risk harmful alkali or cake soap rubbing. They can make your pretty things wear out before their time. For all your nice washables, dresses, blouses, sweaters, the children's things, Stick to care you know is safe. Gentle Lux Flakes. It's care experts advise. More makers of fine washables advise Lux Flakes than advise all other soaps combined. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of A Woman's Face, starring Ida Lupino as Anna Holmes, Brianna Hearn as Dr. Sager, and Conrad Veit as Thorsten Barring. On her home, alias Ingrid Paulson, continues her story. On the witness stand, her face still heavily veiled, she tells the court of the pain and suffering she endured. Twelve operations in twelve months, hoping to be rid of the jagged scar which has tortured her soul since childhood. Since I entered the hospital, I've never seen my face in the mirror. I always bandaged it across my cheek and my eyes. And then one day, I knew the time had come. The day that was to mean failure or success. The day the bandages were to be removed. For the last time. Good morning, Holmes. Good morning. Well, how do you feel? It, it is today, isn't it? Yes. A uh, nurse to stand by, will you? I'm going to remove the dressing. Yes, Doctor. Wait. If it isn't a success, I, I want you to know that oh, I... Don't spoil it. Don't spoil what? Home since the first day I met you, you've presented to me a perfect picture of the most ruthless, cold-blooded creature I've ever met. It's been a picture which has fascinated me, but now, unless I miss my guess, you were about to say something sentimental. Something about gratitude and so forth. Well, don't. All right. 
Now, as I was about to say, I unveil my galatea. Oh, my Frankenstein. Let's get it over with, please. I tell you, Franklin is home. I'm a bit worried. Worried? Why? Well, if this operation's a success, I've created a monster. A beautiful face and no heart. A distinction, I suppose. For all other women with beautiful faces. <laughs> well, we'll remove the bandages now. Don't move. Uh, I said, don't move. There we are. Now, now just one more. Now. Hmm. Well? Interesting. What is it? Well, why don't you tell me? Is it still there? Oh, please tell me. I'll let you see for yourself. No, sir. Give Miss Home a mirror, please. The nurse handed me a mirror. And for the first time in a year, I looked at my face. Miss Home, will you remove your hat, please? And the veil? Yes, Your Honor. Now face the court, please. It's evident that the operation was successful. There isn't a mark on your face now. No, Your Honor. Miss Holmes, will you tell the court exactly how you felt when you realized the scar was gone? Oh, I felt... It's hard to see. It was like being reborn, wasn't it? Yes, that's... I left the hospital, a new person. A new person? <laughs> Not quite, Miss Holmes. If the prosecution will give me time... The prosecution wants to know... If it isn't true that Miss Holm, upon leaving the hospital, went at once to see Torsten Baring. Yes, I did. Yes. Go on, please. I went to his apartment. I hadn't called or written to him for a Oh, you not really after this long silence. Well, I've been in Switzerland. Am I welcome? I bought these flowers for you. Give it out the flowers. You would be welcome to sit down, my dear. You know, you were the first person to ever bring me flowers. Now we are even. We are counted flowing. Is that what you wish? I wouldn't blame you. Well, I hadn't expected that my partner would be quite such a silent one, but there must have been some very good reason for your not writing. Yes. As a matter of fact, there was. Will you take my hat, please? Mm -hmm. It seems a little, uh, a little unfair to... Well... What's the matter? How do you look at me like that? Well, I just want to be afraid. Turn this way. Let me see you. Yes, your eyes are even more beautiful than they were before. <laughs> 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 I'm very happy, my dear. I can't tell you. Here, sit down, sit down, please. This course is for music. When I am, I'm very happy or very sad, I must have you. <laughs> <laughs> tell me... Why didn't you write from Switzerland? The operation hadn't been a success. I was going to disappear anyway. What's that you're playing? Oh, an old weaving song. I heard it first up at my dear uncle's estate at Corsa. It's nice. So is my dear uncle. He very rich? Oh, very, and quite old. I see. He gets it when he dies. Oh, there, my dear, you present an extremely interesting problem. My uncle has a grandson, aged five, a charming little brat, rather frail. If that child lives, he inherits everything. And if he doesn't live? If he doesn't live? My dear girl, what have I been thinking of? I only ask. What if the child doesn't live? Well, then I would inherit it, of course. Here, let me, let me show you some pictures of the estate. This is the house, and these are the waterfalls nearby. Very high, very swift, very dangerous. And there's a little passenger car that travels across the falls on a cable. The little boy is very fond of riding in the car. If his governess should ever be careless, let go of his hand, it would be too bad. By the way, I had a letter from my uncle inviting me up there. He also asked me to recommend a new governess for the boy. You don't know anybody, do you, Uncle? No. Are you sure? It would feel very well and make me very happy. No. Yes, yes, partner. You would be a beautiful governor. Who took the job as governess, Miss Holmes? Yes. 
You went there to kill that child. She doesn't have to answer that. The prisoner will answer. Did you go up to Fossa with the purpose of doing away with that child, Lars Eric Baring? Yes. Go on. I went up to Fossa in November under the name of Ingrid Paulson. It was evening when I arrived. Torsten Baring's uncle took me up at once to see the child. He was already in bed. Come, come. You wouldn't want Miss Paulson to think you didn't know your prayers, would you? Hmm? What, hear my prayers, Miss Paulson? Oh, yes. Yes, please. All right. You too, Grandpa. Me? Oh, of course. You start, huh? Go on. Now I lay me. Now I lay me. Uh, let's see. What's next? Down. Down on a tuffet? <laughs> no, no. That's little Miss Muffet. Oh, I've got it. Now I lay me down to sleep. That's right. I pray the Lord. My soul to keep. If I should die. Before I wake. I pray the Lord. My, my soul, soul to, to take. take. Amen. <laughs> That's the boy. Now, come on. In the bed with you. And tomorrow, Miss Paulson will take you to the falls. Sleep well, my boy. Good night, Miss Paulson. Good night, Consul Barring. Good night, Lars Eric. Miss Paulson, wait. Yes? You didn't kiss me. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? We're going to have fun, aren't we? Good night, Claus Eric. Good night, Miss Paulson. Pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams. He didn't go to the falls the next day. Not the day after that. The child had grown very fond of me. And, and I... And you had grown very fond of him also. Is that what you mean? Yes. <laughs> Go on, please, Miss Holmes. I think the court would like to hear how your subsequent actions bore this out. They were very kind to me at Fawcett, the child and the old man. On the night of the consul's birthday party, I was invited as a guest. Trost and Barling had arrived, and we danced together all evening. Then later, the consul brought another guest to meet me. <laughs> Here he is, a modern miracle, Dr. Gustav Sagert, away from his office. Dr. Sagert. Good evening, Miss Paulson. Good evening, Doctor. And my nephew, Thorsten Barry, Dr. Sagert. How do you do, Dr. Sagert? I think I've had the honor of meeting your wife. Is she with you? No, my wife is traveling. I've uh, just been admiring your dance, Miss Paulson. You'd think she'd been born right in this district, wouldn't uh, you? Indeed, <laughs> yes. But Consul Baring tells me that you've been in Switzerland for the past year. Oh, Geneva mostly. Do you know Switzerland? No, no. I, I've never been there, unfortunately. Consul Baring. Yes, Emma? If you can interest yourself in the other guests, they're almost ready for the Grand March. Yes, I'll be right there. Uh, you must help me, Torsten. Yes, certainly. Thank you for the dance, Miss Paulson. I leave you in good hands, Doctor. Come in the other room. I want to speak to you. Well. Well, what? Well, my cold-blooded, ruthless little Galatea. I can't tell you how relieved I am. Here, come over here in the light. I want to see your face. Ah, uh -huh. good. Very good. So that's why you're so relieved. No, only partly. You had me worried. Imagine looking fearfully in the papers each morning to read of some outrageous crime committed by my beautiful Frankenstein. <laughs> and now I find... You find what? Well, perhaps you could tell me. No. You're the expert. Turn on your lights. <laughs> Unfortunately for humanity, the light hasn't been invented yet that could look into that interesting heart of yours. But perhaps I could issue a preliminary encouraging bulletin. Encouraging? Yes, yeah, uh, tentatively. Let's say that the patient has had the intelligence to find a place where her past life can't tempt her. And the courage to go where her new name might really mean a new life. And let's say that my hopes may have begun to be justified. Because I know about your intelligence... I've seen your courage. And I have hoped. You're very kind to me, Doctor. Everyone is so good and kind to me. Uh, what's the matter? First it's the old man, and then the child, and now you. Can't you all leave me alone? The next day, the child was burned. It wasn't my fault. I was treating him under the ultraviolet ray, and I... I left the light on too long. I called Dr. Sagert at once. How long has he been under this lamp? 
Four minutes over. It's hot, Miss Paulson. My face is hot. Is this his first treatment? No, third. What happened to you? Well, Doctor... It was I... my fault, Doctor. I called Miss Paulson out of the room. It's unfortunate that she went, Mr. Baring. Well, the boy isn't in any pain. Is it bad, Doctor? No, it isn't serious. First degree burns. But another four or five minutes... Now, who directed you to give the boy these ultraviolet treatments? The local doctor. It's for his sinus. I see. Now get me some oil, please. Yes, Doctor. I have it right here. Shall I put it on? Yes, yes. Then can I go skiing this afternoon, Doctor? Well, I don't see why not. Oh, thank you. And please don't be cross with Miss Paulson. She didn't mean to. No, no, I'm quite sure she didn't. Uh, I'll look at him again tonight. Thank you. This probably explains why doctors are always such welcome guests. Yes, yes, possibly. Keep him well covered if he goes out. There, now. Get your clothes on, Lars Eric. Come, dear. I've got first-degree burns. The doctor said so. Yes. Hurry and get dressed before you catch cold. All right. I'll hurry, Miss Paulson. <laughs> Why do you laugh? Your solicitude for the boy's health is most admirable. He might have been scarred for life. For life, did you say? I don't quite understand. Oh, Torsten. Do I have to reassure you every moment? You had to follow me around with a whip. For heaven's sake, Torsten. Give me time. I cannot give you any more time. I have none to waste before tomorrow night. Before tomorrow night? Why? Because. Because that's the way I want it. Miss Holmes, what did Torsten Baring mean? He... He wanted me to. He wanted you to kill the child. He gave you until the next evening to do it, and you agreed. Yes, but I, I tried to argue with him. I couldn't. Why not? Well, I thought I was in love with him. But it wasn't love, I realize now. But it, it was the only thing I'd ever known. The witness will stand down. Stand down, please. Clerk. Yes, Your Honor. Call Dr. Gustav Sagert. Then you assume, Dr. Sagert, that Baring rushed matters because he thought you were suspicious of his actions. Well, let us say that he was suspicious of me. I, I didn't like him, I'll admit that, but I had no real grounds for suspicion. It, it was the girl I was worried about. After the incident with the ultraviolet lamp, I felt that I should warn the consul, and yet I, I wasn't sure. I wanted to give her every chance. But that afternoon, while I was skiing, I happened to come home by way of the fall. Were you alone? Yes, I was looking for Miss Home. Why? I wanted to talk the whole thing over with her. Did you see her that afternoon? Yes. I, uh, I saw her in the passenger car that traveled across the fall. Go on. The, um, the child was with her. I could see them very plainly through my binoculars. She was sitting in the car, very still and very straight. The child was standing on the seat beside her, leaning over the edge and looking down at the fall. How high was this car? Oh, about, uh, about a thousand feet, I should say. They were moving very slowly, almost over the center of the fall. <laughs> I wouldn't fall, would I, Miss Paulson? The other governess I had never let me stand up on a seat like this. She always made me hold her hand. But I'm not afraid. Are you afraid, Miss Paulson? Look, Miss Paulson, I can lean way over the side, see? See, Miss Paulson? Look at me, look! No, give me your hand. Miss Paulson! Give me your hand, do you hear? Give me your hand. <laughs> now hold on to me. <laughs> hold on tight, Mark Eric. Hold on tight. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of A Woman's Face, starring Brian Ahern, Ida Lupino, and Conrad Veidt, after a brief intermission. Now, let's pretend we can see around a couple of corners and through the walls of Patty's house. Hello? Oh, Aunt Helen. I'll call Mother. What did you say? Oh, I'm sorry I sounded like that, only 
Well, Bob is home on leave, and, and I was hoping I'd hear from him tonight. It's hard to wait and hope for a call that doesn't come. And it's even harder to realize that maybe you're the one to blame. You see, dates and romance come to girls who have charm. And one of the most important parts of charm is daintiness. Unless you're sure that everything you wear is always fresh, you can't be sure of daintiness. So don't take chances. Lux under things after every wearing. Dresses, blouses, and sweaters often. If some good friend would only give Patty a hint, chances are that when her phone rang... Hello? Oh, Jack! Why, I'd love to, only... Well, Bob is home on leave, and I've promised... Oh, that would be lovely. See you next week, then. Goodbye. That's the way with Lux girls. They know the importance of daintiness. And that daily luxing for underthings not only protects charm, but helps to keep them lovely longer, too. Rich, lukewarm Lux suds take away soil and perspiration so very gently, with no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing to injure fabrics or colors. Precious fabrics last longer, wear better with this gentle Lux care. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the final curtain falls on tonight's play, Brian Ahern has an interesting story to tell about flying. Don't miss it. Now, the third act of A Woman's Face, starring Brian Ahern, Ida Lupino, and Conrad Veidt. <laughs> Dr. Gustav Sagert is still on the witness stand. In a quiet voice, he gives his testimony. Testimony which will decide whether Anna Holm shall live or die. Then I saw her take the child in her arms, holding on to him tightly until the car had crossed over the falls. Did you inform Counsel Baring of no. what you had seen? No. Why not? Well, I saw no reason. I, uh, I was ashamed of my suspicions, and I felt that the danger to the child was only my imagination. I see. Your Honor, may I interrupt this testimony? You say you are a scientist, sir. I am a doctor, yes. And a doctor deals with facts, not with emotions. Isn't that true? Yes, so far as possible. So far as possible. Tell me this fact, Dr. Sagan. When you saw the prisoner in the car reach for the child, did she of her own free will decide not to kill the child? Or did she refrain from that act because she was aware that you were watching? You have heard my testimony. Yes, and I ask that it be stricken from the record. On what grounds? On the grounds that this scientist's vision is so obscured by emotion as to make any of his so-called facts completely unreliable. What emotion, please? The emotion of love. This witness, a married man, is in love with a prisoner. Dr. Sagert, you have the right to deny this charge. I have no reason to deny the charge. <laughs> Recall the defendant, Anna Holm. One moment, please, Your Honor. You're a married man, Dr. Sagert. Yes, in love with another woman? Yes. Is it true that before you fell in love, you had discovered grounds for divorce against your wife? It is true. That is all. Thank you. Now, Miss Holm, will you tell the court what happened after the episode in the car? I... I returned to the house. All that evening, I avoided Torsten Baring. But he was watching, waiting for a chance to speak to me alone. The next evening, we were all to ride in sleighs to a nearby tavern for dinner. I'd just finished dressing when Torsten Baring came to my room. He was angry. You disappoint me, Anna. I thought you had something different, something strong, rare. Something above a stupid, ugly, commonplace world. Oh, Torsten, I'm a woman. You fool, you coward. Do you want to sink back into the mob, into a dull, safe mediocrity? Is that what you want, safety? Is that what happens when the scar is healed? That one gets fat and forgets? Yes, Anna, you are a woman. But you are something more. Or at least I had hoped you were before this heavenly transformation. I could kill that doctor. What? Before he had changed my partner into a dove, the tail, cooing dove, soft. He get full of love for a fellow man. But I once knew the real honor, the hard, shining brightness of you. There have been women like you before. They became conquerors, queens, empresses. Oh, Torsten, this is 1942. Oh, oh, I apologize. I forgot this is 1942. Yes, the spirit of love has triumphed. No, no, Anna. The times are right. And I could be 
I could be greater than any bar he has ever been or ever will be. You don't know me, Anna. No, no one knows me. I have played the charming fellow, the amiable fool, because I was waiting. I was waiting to find someone like you who had also been cheated. Yes, Anna, you were cheated when you were given that scar. And I was cheated when a boy was born to take away from me what was mine. Money, power. Power, Anna. Power, Anna. And I, I could use this power. What others have done in other countries, I can do here. Because the world belongs to the devil and I know how to serve him. If I can only get the power. The power. Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Am I? Forgive me. I hope I won't have to hurt you again. I knew then that Torsten Baring was mad. Insane. He left the room laughing. His eyes wild and fearsome. When I thought his sleigh had gone, I went downstairs. But I took a gun with me. I was to ride in the sleigh with Lars Eric, and I was afraid. Uh, hurry, hurry in, we're ready to leave. Where's Lars Eric? Lars Eric! Has the first sleigh gone yet? Lars Eric! Are you riding with me, Miss Paulson? I, I don't know, Doctor. I can't find the child. Lars Eric! Lars Eric, where are you? There's no use calling him. He's already gone. Gone? Can't be. He was supposed well, to... He was gone, just the same. He left in the first sleigh with Mr. Boring. Oh, no, no. What's the matter? Doctor say that we've got to find them. Follow him. Follow him. Hurry, Doctor. Faster, please, faster. Is the boy with him? Yes, I can see him. They're going towards the falls. He must be drunk to travel at this speed. He'll turn himself over. He isn't drunk. He's insane. I found out this afternoon. Insane? He's going to kill the child. That's why he's going to the falls. Can't you go any faster? You're gaining on him. If he reaches the falls before we do... Hold on, don't stand up. He knows we're following him. He's looking back. Torsten! How far is it to the edge of the falls? I don't know. Less than a mile from the house. I think we're almost there now. I'll come up alongside him and turn him into the snowbank. You can't. He's at the edge of the road. You'll go over the cliff. Torsten! Stop! Stop, Torsten! We're almost up to him. If only I can get on the right side of him. There's one way to stop him. Pull up as close as you can. What are you going to do? As close as you can. Hurry. Don't lean out like that. What are you... What's that? Is that a gun you have? Yes. Torsten! Torsten, do you hear me? Stop the sleigh! Stop! Put that gun away, you little fool! <laughs> Torsten! Sit down! Torsten! I'm warning you! I'll kill you if you don't stop! I'll kill you, Torsten! <laughs> Anna! I told him I do. I told him! I warned him! When I shot the second time, Torsten Baring fell out of the sleigh and into the gorge. The sleigh came to a stop near the edge of the falls, and the child was safe. I knew what I was doing. I knew there was a chance that both of them would be killed, but I fired the shots. It was the only thing I could do. Are there any more witnesses? No more witnesses, Your Honor. You may stand down, Miss Holm. The court decrees that the case of the Crown against Honor Holm is suspended for consultation. Dr. Sagett, will you come with me, please? Miss Holm would like to speak to you. Thank you for coming. You wanted to see me? Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you if, if you meant what you said. On the witness stand? I must have meant it. I was under oath. As God is my help in life and soul. As God is your help. You'll need it. Will I? Where's your mind, Doctor? Why don't you go now while you still have a chance? Go. Run. Don't look back. Why must I go? You couldn't love me. You don't think for a moment I've changed from what I was. No, not changed. No, of course not. I'm ruthless. Cold-blooded. You told me what I was. Oh, that wasn't you, Anna. It never has been you. That's why I told the truth. I am in love with you. Well, 
There's nothing you can do about it. Get out of the matter, you? No. No, you must. Do you hear? Why not? Because I want so much to be happy. I want to have a home and have children. I want to belong to the human race. Oh, I want to belong. Judge will see you now. Get his, get his verdict. Gustav, will you come with me? Will you stand beside me? And he tells me. I'll be there, darling. Don't you worry. Judge is waiting, Miss Holmes. I'm ready. And in the case of Anna Holm versus the Crown, the defendant charged with murder in the first degree is hereby adjudged not guilty. Before our stars return for a curtain call, here's an amusing thing I read the other day. A book published way back in the gay 90s gave this advice to the ladies. If your hands are red, soak your feet in a basin of hot water. Well, that's a quaint method of dealing with dishpan hands. Today, we've a simpler and more direct way. Yes, if you've let your hands get into that sad state, you can correct it while you're washing your dishes. All you have to do is change from the strong soap that's been causing the trouble to gentle Lux flakes. Actual tests have proved this. The women who made these tests used no creams or lotions on their hands. They just changed to Lux, and their hands lost that rough red dishpan look, regained their natural loveliness. Did it so quickly, too. You could see a difference in from two to seven days. Now, isn't that worth trying? You can prove for yourself that it really works. Prove it for less than a penny a day. That's all it costs to change from strong soaps to gentle lux for your dishes. See what quick suds you get, what rich, long-lasting suds that are famous for mildness. And see how fast your hands grow softer, smoother again. Get the generous big box of Lux Flakes first thing tomorrow and use it for your dishes every day. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our star. For an exciting performance of exciting drama, the credit goes to Ida Lupino, Brian Ahern, and Conrad Bison. Oh, thank you, C.B. It's a great pleasure to be here again. The way you fly in and out, you don't see much of you flying. Well, I'm kind of up in the air these days, Ida. He means that literally, too. How many hours a day are you flying, Brian? Well, I'm actually flying about three or four at present, Conrad, and doing ground courses of navigation and meteorology and things like that on the side. I'm taking what is called an instructor's refresher course over in Arizona. If all goes well, I hope to be a fully-fledged instructor. Hey, why don't you come over and join us, C.B.? It's a perfect job for a director. All you have to do is tell the other people what to do. Huh. I think I'd have to start in as a student again, Brian. I haven't flown a plane in eight years. Well, now, let's see. Most of the students are about uh, 18 or 19 years old. Well, Brian, I guess he just misses. <laughs> By a little over 40 years. <laughs> Have you had any narrow escapes, Brian? Oh, no. The old daredevil kind of flying went out with barnstorming. This is strictly business. By the way, do any of you know, know Chinese? Well, my limit is uh, chop suey and chow mein. Brian, what's Chinese got to do with aviation? Well, there are a great number of Chinese pilots being trained down there where I am, and the instructors are having a pretty interesting time. If he wants to talk about the wings, he has to flap his arms. If he's explaining a bank, he has to glide around the room like a bird. If he wants to talk about the wind, he just goes... Now, <gasps> suppose the Chinese boys don't understand him. Well, he'll discover that when he gets one up in a plane. But the safety record of all flight training is amazing now. If you follow the rules, you keep out of trouble, even though it seems, may seem like the hard way at the time. By the way, Ida, what are you doing these days? The hard way. Only in my case, it's the name of a picture of Warner Brothers. Well, have you picked a play for next week, Mr. DeMille? Yes, it's a story about motion pictures, Ida. The paramount hit, Sullivan's Travel. And our stars will be George Brent and Veronica Lake. 
George plays a picture director who decides to become a hobo to get a new slant on life. He gets more than he bargained for when he's joined by a girl, played by Veronica Lake, who turns the hobo trip into a melodramatic adventure. It was a very interesting picture, C.P. I'm looking forward to hearing it on the air. Good night. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Thank you. Good night. The woman faced with our costume tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my business is motion pictures and radio. I'm not an economist. But it's a plain fact that this country is on a spending spree. There are fewer goods to buy, and more people have the money to buy them. They're bidding against each other in one gigantic, terrible auction. It's as simple as apple pie that if we don't put every possible dollar into war bonds and stamps, we're in for uncontrolled inflation. Take a look at your budget, as I'm doing myself, and see how many more bonds and stamps you can buy by cutting out luxuries. And for every $3 you put in a war bond, you'll get $4 back in 10 years. That's good business, and it's also good patriotism. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Veronica Lake and George Brent in Sullivan's Travels. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Brian Ahern's latest picture is the Columbia production, A Night to Remember. Heard in tonight's play were Norman Field as judge, Lillian Bond as Vera Sagert, Bobby Larson as Lars Eric, Griff Barnett as Barring, Aubrey Mather as prosecutor, Vernon Steele as defense attorney, and Leo Cleary, Charles Steele, Jeff Corey, Jane Morgan, and Josephine Gilbert. Our music was directed by Louis Silver. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Veronica Lake and George Brent in Sullivan's Travel. When you buy vitamins, two of the world's greatest vitamin authorities back your choice of Vim, the new vitamin mineral tablet. Vim.